Welcome. This is Hernan Murdoch. We continue talking about risk assessment and risk assessment elements that are important to know about. In this episode, we're going to talk about risk assessment process, the risk assessment factors. We're also going to talk a bit about the risk control matrix. To help us better understand these elements related to risk assessments, we have with us Kathleen Crawford, who is very experienced in all things internal audit. She's our subject matter expert today, and we would like her to help us better understand these topics. Hi, Kathleen. Hey, Hernan. How are you? I am well, thank you. Good. So we're very curious about the risk assessment process. There are so many pieces to it. And one of the things we would like to get a better understanding about and help us because we're always focusing on the pragmatic side of things, what are some of those key questions that internal auditors should think about and use when they are engaging with their clients so their risk assessments can be done well? Well, there are a lot of questions, and we could go at this from many different directions, but we picked a few that we thought might be of particular interest to our viewers. Uh, I'd like to uh, sort of set the stage with what could go wrong so when we consider the areas, processes, and systems that we're auditing, we want to think about what must go wrong or what shouldn't go wrong, rather. But we also have to think about, if you see the third question on this uh, graphic, we want to make sure that we're also considering what must go right for the area, process, or system to succeed. So for mm -hmm. me, those are two overarching concerns, and we want to keep that in balance or keep that in stasis. Um, yes. As we consider uh, the, what the nature of the area is that we're looking at, we want to think about uh, what could cause failure, uh, how could something or someone disrupt the area, um, and remember everything goes back to objectives. So how are they able to uh, determine and document whether or not they're achieving their objectives? Are there any Kathleen, points? So Mm -hmm. So we were talking quite a bit about uh, making sure that we capture from our audit clients what their objectives are. But what you're highlighting here is not just a matter of capturing what those objectives happen to be, but sure. also how they know if they're tracking well towards achieving those objectives. Indeed. Is that right? It is. Okay. Okay. It Very absolutely good. Okay. is. So just having an objective, uh, it might be wishful thinking. Are they paying attention to uh, the progress that they're making or not making, and are they making adjustments consequently? Excellent. Okay, that helps a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, continue. I'm curious about other questions that you think would be helpful for auditors. Very good. Will do. So uh, we talk about vulnerability. We talk about liquidity. And um, to your point about objectives, do they have the resources that they need? And do they need to be protected in some way, shape, or form? And how would that be for those accomplished? For those who are not familiar with accounting and finance and the terminology, they may be new to the profession and this field in general, uh, liquid assets. Are we talking about syrup? Are we talking about <laughs> water and milk? Or what are we talking about? Yes, here? yes. Well, I mean, uh, in a desert, we'd want water. But in, in uh, auditing, we want to make sure that if there are some objectives that require cash on hand, that they have enough of it so that they, their resources, their financial and other resources are not tied up in other priorities and possibly uh, keep them from accomplishing the, their objectives in this particular area that we might be looking at. So that's what I mean by liquid assets. Um, so I they love, are the ones that can be converted to cash, exactly. they're already cash, or can be easily converted to cash. Exactly, exactly. Excellent, okay, very good. So I want to clarify, thank you. All right, no <laughs> okay, problem. Carry on. <laughs> well, uh, we, in addition to um, these questions, let's uh, see the next graphic. Uh, I would also say another asset is information. What kind of information does this area process system or system rely on most? And, um, and uh, linking back to the liquid assets, where do they spend their money and how are they spending it if it is, mm -hmm. in fact, a financial area? So you'll notice that a number of these qu key questions are in the area of financing and uh, thinking. think about this in the context of, of project management. There may be um, some key projects that the area is trying to enact um, and their activities, their supporting activities need to be funded. 
Um, maybe they're envisioning some, um, some revenue stream that will come from this uh, project. So depending on where they are in the life cycle of a project, they have to pay attention to money and other resources and how they flow in and out. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so, so the flows, understanding the process and how the money moves about, like they say, follow the money, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I would also argue that, that risk uh, is proportional to complexity. So another area that we want to consider is how complex is this area processor system? It's, uh, it's overarching um, activity and anything that is the underpinning of its activity. Uh, we have to think about judgment. So going back to the question about uh, resources, uh, personnel, and points of vulnerability, uh, are there decisions and are there actions that are going to require some judgment? And which of those require the most judgment? And are the people and their capacities matched to those sorts of situations? These are very helpful because there are so many things that need to be kept in mind. And lists like these can help us quite a bit understand how we can um, frame our mind and make sure we don't forget an important question that could be vital <clears throat> to full understanding what's going on. So from the perspective of complexity, my experience has been that if uh, the process is very complex, people are confused, uh, there are a lot of exceptions to the process, that that is, is I refer to that, that's where the risk aggregates. Mm -hmm. And if you're thinking about judgment to, to pick up another one of your points, uh, as relates to, for example, a management override, which I think is, you know, so far of it is just a judgment outright, where they decide to do one thing or another, and they have a lot of discretion. Mm -hmm. And then if they're going to then say, okay, well, we don't want to do it this way, or we'll, we'll do it that way instead, or not now, but later. So those uh, elements of, of management override, so it kind of falls under the umbrella of judgment. I think that that can also be very troublesome, because it may, uh, like I said earlier, the risk might then basically aggregate in those points during that process or in that process cycle, and that can really um, complicate uh, an understanding. And of course, as we get into controls later in another episode, we'll see how these things can definitely impact the stability of those processes. So as far as, um, and going back to, to the complexity and judgment and various elements like what you just described, what are these things about uh, risk assessment factors or risk factors sure. that internal auditors should be mindful about and, and consider when they're doing their work. Well, on the next graphic, we'll uh, take a quick look at that. Uh, the larger factors are ones that are uh, contained in the environment, if you will. So what is the ethical climate like? What is the management style? Um, the, the reference to competence applies here as well. Um, and I, I want folks to really think about the fact that we, we, uh, we look broadly, but then we filter out those things that are not um, relevant to the particular audit that we're doing. But we want to make sure that we consider and, um, and decide what deserves our attention or what might present an area of concern. So other, okay. the points about management judgment are very much in play here. Uh, other things like um, geographical dispersion uh, of operations. So how centralized or decentralized uh, might this process or this area be? And what might that mean in terms of raising or lowering its risk? Complexity yes. okay. comes up again too. So factors, uh, in a way, are those items or elements that in their presence or absence will either exacerbate or diminish the risk. Absolutely. Right? Uh, yes. So uh, com as complexity goes up, your risk profile will go up. As competence goes up, your risk profile will tend to go down because people right. know how to do their jobs. Right. So, okay, right. very good. Thank you. Uh, are there other factors that we also need to keep in mind? Well, I would also, um, in addition to geographical dispersion, I would also think about complexity in general. Uh, but one that I skipped over that um, makes a big difference is what's the, in terms of culture and, um, and pressure, are there, uh, we want goals to be pursued, we want goals to be achieved, but we also don't want undue pressure to produce 
um, these goals because that could put the organization at a disadvantage, especially if you have competent people who are noticing some trends that are not so beneficial. We want to make sure that we don't just stick to a plan because that's what we decided you know, a few months ago, if, if anyone sees that something is going wrong, they should have the freedom to speak up and, um, and the uh, organization should consider making some adjustments. And, and there have been instances uh, where organizations have had some massive problems where employees felt that they could not not achieve some, or at least pretend to achieve some goals. A uh, major financial institution with uh, cross-selling and upselling mm -hmm. uh, expectations, and uh, a lot of employees end up creating fake accounts. Uh, we had uh, hospitals as well, where uh, employees could not keep up with the volume of patients coming in, and they uh, created these fake uh, waiting lists. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, when uh, some of these, um, I refer to them as the law of unintended consequences, where right. you have the, the goal of uh, creating incentives and motivating people to work uh, towards certain goals, but if they are felt as being unachievable, you can have the counter effect. Yeah. Well, so I would say here one of the points about risk is to not just look at what could harm us or or um, detract our, from our ability to accomplish the goals, but what are the enablers? The people who are competent. So you talked about that inverse relationship between competence of employees. As that rises, the risk falls. So we want to see that these things are in some kind of balance, and we want to consider not just things that restrict or, or inhibit us, but also uh, think about risk in the context of enablers or support for, uh, for better practices uh, around the organization. Excellent. Yes. Okay. So there are quite a few risk factors then that uh, can be considered and should be considered, not just can be considered, but should be considered. So as we think about the risk assessment process, then how many different ways can you do this? I would oh. imagine that there are a lot of different possibilities on how to go about preparing a risk assessment. So what are some scenarios? Well, um, I'm told that 57 plus ingredients go into Heinz special sauce. I would argue, <laughs> I would argue that um, the sauce uh, in, in the case of risk assessment um, is something that's very um, personalized, personalized to the organization uh -huh. in terms of culture, uh, management style, um, the, the um, industry within which it finds itself. So there are many, many uh, influences on how to uh, prepare a risk assessment. Uh, these are not intended to be um, uh, a laundry list of everything that we need to do. Uh, high, medium, and low, uh, three to 10 point scales. You can appreciate that high, medium, and low as a three point scale is simpler um, than a 10 point scale. Uh, the level of sophistication is going to depend a great deal on the nature of the business, the nature of a specific area or process, and how we will be able to compare um, uh, area to area in terms of deciding what rises to the top for us to uh, evaluate it. I've also known, um, I've worked in a couple of organizations that had very, very sophisticated risk assessment approaches uh, that included factors and weights. And in one of those institutions, it was very, very difficult to distinguish the priority of some of the audit projects because several of the projects were really clumped together on the, uh, the list of, of things we were going to do for a fiscal year, and they were separated by hundredths dot zero zero mm -hmm. one wow. um, of a percentage <laughs> point. So that, um, that's more complicated than I like to see. I tend to favor um, things that are more on the side of simplicity. Not, not simplistic, but simpler. Mm -hmm so that uh, everyone can appreciate um, what high means, what medium means, and what low means, both in likelihood and impact. So we want yes. to be mindful of that. Yes, uh, I like what you said about the simplicity and making sure that it does the job and it helps us capture what we're really looking for. Uh, but uh, when we think about risk management and, and risk assessments in particular, there are some very, and, and I know that there are a lot of other, like you said, right? There are many different ways that it can be done. And there are some statistical methods as well um, with uh, scenario analysis, Monte Carlo analysis, uh, a lot of simulations and stress testing and various things like those. Sure. So uh, there are definitely a lot of different ways. But at the end of the day, the purpose is 
to identify those areas that we need to focus on and simplicity. Uh, don't make things more complex than they need to be right. for our purposes. Right. Very exactly. good message there. Exactly. So as uh, individuals go about doing their risk assessments, uh, the, the term inherent value or risk, inherent risk rather, uh, and residual risk, and those terms sometimes come to the surface. What do those mean? Sure. On the next graphic, we have uh, a comparison. So uh, inherent versus residual risk on uh, one side and enterprise versus audit risk on the other. Inherent risk is uh, something that is risky of its nature. So certain activities, um, certain processes, certain procedures are, um, I'm using the, the same uh, term in the definition, but inherently risky. There's something about it that uh, would give people pause because they don't want to take a chance or they're not certain of the terrain, so they don't want to proceed. Um, what we're mo more interested, we are interested in, in inherent risk, but what we're more interested in as auditors is residual risk. It, residual risk is an equation that we can calculate by looking at inherent risk, and if we have uh, a model that is, um, has adequately predicted that, then we look at key controls. The key controls that we are, uh, we've been told or we expect are in this area processor system as a balance against that inherent risk leaves us with residual risk, which means that's what's left over. If the, the key controls are operating as intended, then the inherent risk comes down and the organization, the process, the system, or the functional area is working within an environment of risk that they can tolerate. That's one side of the um, risk picture. Another side of the risk so, picture for us is what before you, you Before right. you go on, Kathleen, one, one quick thing then. So the residual risk uh, will then, as you mentioned just now, then that will then connect back to risk appetite. Absolutely. And you yes. hope that the residual risk is within what the organization considers prudent yes. based on their culture and expectations. Okay, Ex excellent. Exactly so. And, and then the other thing will be, therefore, that if the controls are not working the way they are supposed to work, then that residual risk will snap back to the inherent risk. Mm -hmm. So that, once again, is a big part of the purpose of internal auditors who then review those controls to make sure that they're really there and they're really doing their jobs. That therefore will say, okay, yes, they're adequate. They're doing what they're supposed to do. So now, yes, we have assurance or reasonable assurance that they are at the residual level. Right. Right. Excellent. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Take us to the next piece, please. Okay. So the other piece is where where we will uh, evaluate risk ourselves. So independently, uh, we'll look at enterprise level risk. So that is high level. What is true about the industry, the environment within which this organization or this activity occurs. Um, are, there, uh, are there risks in some of the financial reporting that have been identified? Those are our, our 10Ks. That's what that particular point refers to. So a publicly traded company has to produce a report uh, periodically that identifies a certain enterprise risks. And that's what 10Ks that's are your year-end financial statements. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Then, um, then the next area that we would be concerned with is the audit universe. What can we, as internal audit, as the function of internal audit, uh, reliably carry out and focus on for, uh, say, a, a particular time horizon? So I spoke about this in another episode as something that might be an annual plan or a semi-annual plan that we put together. What does the universe look like in terms of what we can focus on and do a good job in evaluating? And then when it comes down to what we're talking about here, the audit level. The audit level is on the project level. What can and should we take on now? What can we look at? Um, and do we understand what has changed since the last audit in this area processor system? Presuming that there has been another audit in this area processor system. So it may well be that this is the first audit of its type. And so when we think about the audit level here, we're going to need to do a, a pretty substantial amount of study to wrap our minds around what, um, what we should be looking at um, in order to do a good job in this particular instance. 
Excellent. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. This is very helpful to better understand uh, these elements related to the risk assessment. So if we were to think about uh, a matrix, risk control matrix, mm -hmm. so what will a matrix look like, at least conceptually? What, what, will, what are some of the key in, in elements or ingredients in that matrix? We have a concept drawing to, um, to demonstrate that point. So a risk control matrix is a, um, a, an organizing uh, mechanism for internal auditors to use to better follow the track of thinking in terms of what we're going to audit. So it starts with business objectives. Um, you might see in, in real life a risk control matrix would have many, many layers to it. So we're only taking a small slice out of uh, a hypothetical uh, risk control matrix. I, I want you to notice, viewers, that the, um, the first column is on objectives. Everything flows from business objectives. So in this case, we expect that transactions are processed in a way that is properly authorized and done so in an accurate and timely fashion. Why, uh, what might be a risk to that? Well, we might find financial loss because things were not properly authorized, or we could experience client dissatisfaction because uh, that we haven't uh, operated in a timely fashion or the transactions were inaccurate in some way. So these are um, our real risks that um, an organization could suffer, the kinds of control activities. So back to inherent versus residual risk. Inherently, these risks could be a problem. Control activities, in this case, that all client instructions are received by investor services and that the activity itself, any action or uh, decision or change in the loan activity is undertaken only on the expressed client instruction. So that type of control okay. activity brings it into a balance that is uh, seen as residual risk, and that's what our audit tests will, um, will address. And in this example, we have a sample. Um, we'll be talking about sampling and, uh, and other sorts of ways we choose what we're going to do in another episode. But a sample, probably a statistical sample of transactions, reviewing for these client instructions to see that there was proper authorization. And that's how it flows. This is exactly a kind of a, a deliverable that you can expect to see in your working papers will be another subject for another time. But this is the kind of thing that you're going to put together and um, as a document of what your, um, your audit program is going to be. Excellent. Yes, so that was... Um that is something that usually done during the planning phase. Mm -hmm. And yes, so we have the objectives, we have the risks, and then they may be categorized uh, compliance, operational, strategic, IT. Um, the IA standards also require us to consider the possibility of fraud. So we may want to consider about some fraud risks associated with that. And then, yes, we are going to examine uh, control activities and st uh, audit step procedures later on. So this is very good uh, and very, very helpful. So I really appreciate the fact that you took the time to help us understand these components and appreciate in more detail how a risk assessment is completed and how uh, we come up with some deliverables related to it. So better understand the risk assessment process. We are looking at some of those key questions, the factors that feed into this assessment, and we're looking in terms also at the risk control matrix. So we have a better appreciation for all of those things. So thank you very much. My pleasure. If you like this series, subscribe to the ACI Learning YouTube channel to enjoy more audit-related content.